Good evening. Uh, welcome to this special meeting of the Salem City Council. It's a work session with the Salem Kaiser Area Mass Transit District uh, Board. Um, and we'll get underway with a roll call, please, Courtney. Councillor Stapleton? I'm here. Councillor Nishioka? Present. Councillor Phillips? Here. Councillor Leon? Here. Councillor Gonzalez? Here. Councillor Hoy? Here. Councillor Nordeg? Here. Councillor Lewis? Oh, that's terrible. Councillor Varney, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm here. <laughs> and Mayor Bennett? Here. Thank you. And from the Salem Area Mass Transit District Board, President Ian Davidson? Here. Director Sadie Carney is just trying to get into the meeting, so we'll give her a minute and come back. Uh, Director Inohos Presi? I'm here and you did great. Thank you. Uh, Director Navarro? Here. Director Sarah Duncan? Here. And Director Nguyen? Here. Uh, Director Carney? Present. Hi. Thank you. Everyone's here and present. Everyone's here, great. Uh, President Davidson, would you lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? I'd be happy to. Thank you. The class, and must be. I pledge allegiance Just to the flag of the United States, States of America, America, America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you, Ian. Um, Councilor Hoy, could uh, I have a motion for approval of special meeting agenda? I move for approval of the special meeting agenda. Second. Second by Phillips. Is there any discussion? Okay. Uh, Courtney, could you call the roll? Councilor Stapleton? Aye. Councilor Nishioka? Aye. Councilor Phillips? Aye. <clears throat> Councilor Leon? Aye. Thank you. Councilor Gonzalez? Aye. Councilor Hoy? Aye. Councilor Nordyk? Aye. Councilor Varney? Aye. And Mayor Bennett? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any additions or deletions, Councilor Hoy? No. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move uh, forward then to our discussion, which is coordination of city and transit district planning projects. Um, I guess uh, Julie Warnke from our staff will be leading this dis this uh, discussion. Is that correct, Julie? Yes, I'll be okay. kicking it off and then getting um, help from transit as well. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so good evening. My name is Julie Warnicke. I'm the transportation planning manager for the city of Salem Public Works Department. I would like to direct your attention to the staff report that was prepared for tonight's work session. It provides an overview of the topics that we will be discussing. I'm going to start off by providing a brief overview of ongoing coordination and collaboration between the city and chariots. Following this introduction, chariots will give an overview of two recent planning projects, the Long Range Transit Plan and the South Salem Transit Center Study. I will close out the presentation portion of this work session with an overview of recent and upcoming planning efforts relating to transportation in the city. Then we have time reserved for questions and discussion from the board and city council. We regularly collaborate as regional partners as part of the Regional Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is called SCATS. SCATS stands for the Salem Kaiser Area Transportation Study, but I'll refer to it as SCATS for short. Councillor Phillips represents the city of Salem on the SCATS Policy Committee, and Director Carney represents the Chariots Board on that body. Staff members from both organizations serve on the SCATS Technical Advisory Committee. 
SCATS is an important arena for collaboration because it, because it is the organization charged with developing and adopting the federally required Metropolitan Transportation Plan. This plan guides transportation planning and funding for our region. Additional regional collaboration occurs through the Mid Willamette Valley Area Commission on Transportation, which is referred to as MWACT. This body includes representatives from Marion, Polk, and Yamhill counties who work together on transportation issues of mutual concern. Both the city and chariots are represented on this commission. Salem and chariots have a long history of coordinating on transportation and land use planning, as well as on transportation operations. Over the last three years, staff from both organizations have met monthly to coordinate and collaborate. These meetings are alternatively hosted by the city and chariots, originally in person, but currently virtually. These meetings have allowed us to develop and maintain relationships that carry over into multitude of projects. Areas that have seen improved coordination include transit signal priority, locating improved pedestrian crossings and their design as it relates to location and operation of bus stops, land use planning to support the chariot's core network, reducing parking requirements along the chariot's core network, emergency staging for chariot's bus buses at Bush's Pasture Park, city adoption of new code language to prohibit parking at transit stops in conjunction with new development, improved understanding of development review process, and many more. In addition to the monthly coordination meetings, we have collaborated on specific planning studies, including serving on committees to support the Chariot's Long Range Transit Plan, the R Salem Project, and the Salem Climate Action Plan. The city and chariots also support each other through mutual support of grant applications. For example, chariots supported the city's recently awarded application to construct street improvements on McGillcrest. The city likewise supports chariots grant application to purchase battery electric buses and related charging infrastructure. With that, I would like to turn this over to, I believe Ted Stonecliff is going to go first with a presentation on the long range transit plan. Thank you, Julie. I will share my screen so you all can see my presentation here and uh, we'll get started. Are you able to see the presentation? Okay. Well, good evening, Chariots Board and City Council members. My name is Ted Stonecliffe, and I'm a transit planner at Chariots and also the deputy project manager for the Long Range Transit Plan project. Tonight, I'll give you an overview of the project and give a preview of what, what it will contain in its draft form. The Long Range Transit Plan, or LRTP as we love to call it, is the first ever 20 year planning document for the district. We've been working with a consultant team on the project for the last 12 months, where we have examined the existing condition of transit services, talked to the public about their needs for future services, worked with our partners at SCATS to examine different strategies for delivering transit. And we went back to the public to confirm whether these modeled results were what they were wanting. And now, we're in the middle of compiling the draft using all of the public feedback obtained over the past uh, couple of months. The long range plan will include answers to questions like, who will, who will chariots serve in the future? What types of services will chariots provide? What policies and guidelines will guide the implementation of the plan? How will the district grow with resilience dodging changes in the economy and other cultural factors? And what funding sources will be available? I also wanna highlight some of the 
plans that were reviewed and considered in developing the long range transit plan. Uh, Chariots does a needs assessment, which is a short term plan for making changes with existing or projected, projected funding sources. Um, we're looking at that. We're looking at regional transportation and land use plans. Uh, for example, the R Salem changes to the city's comprehensive plan and the city's climate action plan. <clears throat> the LRTP will inform the Metropolitan Transportation Plan update uh, that SCATS will be working on in the next couple of years. And it will inform the City of Salem's Transportation System Plan update in the same time frame. Uh, there are three st strategies that are general that will be included in the long range transit plan, uh, continued excellence, future opportunity, and organizational growth. Under continued excellence, the plan will call for the continued goal uh, for delivering a world-class customer experience for the traveling public, prioritizing such improvements uh, for historically marginalized and disadvantaged populations. Safety and security are high on the priority list. For future opportunities, uh, with additional funds becoming available in the future, how will the district decide to grow and improve? Expansion of the local transit network to serve disadvantaged communities first, adding frequency, improving access, comfort, and information available to riders. And finally, organizational growth. How will chariots stay relevant, resilient, and connected, exploring new funding options to position for growth? So the following, sli following three slides are to do with different policies and guidelines that uh, we're aiming to tackle in the plan. And the first one is about zero emission bus deployment. <clears throat> Uh, as you may know, the Chariots Board has passed a resolution to have the Chariots fleet go 100% zero emissions by 2040. Uh, the, the focus of the long range transit plan, uh, we heard from the public that the priority should be on the core network, but certainly our entire system will be zero emissions uh, by 2040, uh, prioritizing low income and disadvantaged communities, the areas that those are served first, <clears throat> and high ridership routes. Uh, new vehicle types uh, would be experienced on all of our services, such as paratransit, which is chariots lift, our flex routes, and regional routes. Uh, the next one is flexible service areas. This could be uh, a new transit service uh, for less dense areas of the urban area and in some of our rural areas. Uh, and this will help us to complete our transit network, fill in those gaps that exist today uh, where there's a, an identified need. Uh, the priority will be uh, once again to our vulnerable customers and safe and accessible access, partnering with the city, uh, with all cities in our jurisdiction to provide sidewalk, sidewalk and crosswalk infrastructure. <clears throat> and these flexible services would most likely connect to our frequent level routes and locations. Finally, uh, the policy for high capacity transit will be broached in this in this plan uh, because it is a 20-year document. We may not be ready for high capacity transit yet, but the plan will give us a toolbox to find out when we will be ready for something like bus rapid transit in its own guideway or right-of-way, uh, prioritizing uh, what level of rider delay passenger loads and speeds uh, thresholds that where we would need to, to reach before studying whether to deploy 
high capacity transit. Uh, and once again, prioritizing the core network for these high capacity modes, connecting those high use activity centers that have been identified in the city's comprehensive plan. And we're calling that an operational linchpin that would leverage um, the transit network to make it more useful for folks. So the next steps in our project are uh, to present the draft of the plan to uh, the chariots board in October, <clears throat> uh, following by the adoption of, by the board in November. And that's when SCATS will be kicking off their MTP update process, where we will be working with them to bring in all of the changes from the R Salem comprehensive plan um, and re-looking at, at modeling. Uh, and this time, instead of 20 years, it would be to 2050, which is 27 years if, at my last, last count. But uh, that's all that I have for the long range transit plan. And I believe Steve Dickey will be giving an update on the South Salem Transit Center. Great. Very good. Thank you. Are I there will. any questions for uh, Mr. Stonecliff? This uh, one, uh, one question I had just sort of, I want to make sure I understand that you will be sort of interfacing with our transportation, long range transportation planning as it develops under our, our Salem. Is that how you see the relationship with our Salem primarily? Yes, absolutely. Uh, as Julie mentioned, we have monthly meetings uh, with the city and during those meetings we're constantly talking about what's happening with the R Salem project. And now that it's adopted, we'll be uh, looking at the impacts um, in a more serious way with uh, the SCATS modeling team and uh, the update to the MTP. Uh, so that brings us to the, the city's update to the transportation system plan. Um, anything that we're doing in the uh, with SCATS in that MTP update will be uh, utilized by the city. Um, and so we're really excited to see what those those new impacts could be um, in the modeling world and eventually out there in the real world. <laughs> Great. Uh, President Davidson. Thank you, Mayor. Ted, I'm hoping you could maybe briefly describe what high capacity transit might look like and the benefits it would be to our community? Absolutely. Uh, so high capacity transit, as you know, has many different forms. Uh, it could be like the bus rapid transit that Eugene has, the MX line uh, that that city has enjoyed for over a decade, um, where parts of it could be in dedicated right of way and parts of it would be running on uh, public streets and, and general traffic lanes. Um, generally, you would have more frequent fr uh, bus service on, on a facility like that. You would have uh, transit stations, which are uh, would give more amenities for folks, maybe real time bus arrival information, as well as uh, the ability to uh, purchase your ticket on the platform before boarding the bus, that sort of thing. Um, so it's uh, integrating many of the things that uh, you might associate with rail transit on a bus system. Uh, uh, so I think I'll stop there, but certainly if you have other questions. <laughs> well, in behalf of our former counselor, Tom Anderson, who, who really has been a, a a strong advocate for a trolley system. Is a trolley part of this uh, this part of your discussion? Or it's not is out trolley of the question. too vague? <laughs> uh, it's not out of, out of the question. It's not something that <clears throat> we're not going to say whether or not there will be bus rapid transit or there will be a trolley in the future. But uh, the, the document will be setting thresholds uh, for when we would get to the point where we would want to study such a, a service. So uh, I know the, the downtown trolley has been something that uh, the city has been interested in for a number of years. And um, 
uh, we really haven't had a feasibility study to yeah. uh, look at that closer. <clears throat> so I think this will get us one step closer to that uh, by setting policy and by, um, uh, so I hope that's specific enough. Yeah, that, that is. Councilor Stapleton. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, so my question for you is, I heard a little bit in your presentation about how you want to go to zero emissions by a certain date. In the, the climate action plan that we have here at the city, we have increasing percentage of ridership. Um, can you tell me, is the chariots board or you, or however I asked this question correctly, uh, fully in support of the Salem climate action plan? How do they complement each other? Uh, what are your goals for ridership and what are the dates that you're hoping to increase those by? And, and do we all kind of line up together? Is there some kind of a connection there? Great question. And that may be a, another question that uh, the board members want to weigh in on. But I, I will say that, yes, the, the long range transit plan is taking any recommendations that are coming out of the Salem Climate Action Plan and uh, trying to put those to work. So uh, if it's ridership goals or um, zero emission vehicle goals, uh, those are definitely things that uh, Chariots is, is on our way to, uh, to meeting in a, uh, in a certain timeline. The timelines haven't all been determined, of course, but uh, another thing that I think Julie will touch on uh, some more in the in this meeting will be the climate friendly equitable communities rules that have been received and <clears throat> the city is developing uh, what that will look like for uh, the community so transit will be responding to those rules as they are developed as well and we'll be working with Julie and her team uh, to make sure that we're uh, we're not putting something out there that is not achievable but but you're developing purposeful alignments as staff uh, part of the staff interaction is seeing where the alignments are will be or could be is that kind of what you're up to yes and um, julie i don't know if you want to add anything to that or hi julie hi and yes yeah, yes, defi very definitely. And as Ted alluded to, I will touch on that when we get to my um, my presentation later on. Okay, great. Uh, President Davidson. Thanks, Mayor. Just wanted to uh, speak on behalf of the board to address uh, Councillor Stapleton's question. Um, so as Ted mentioned, we've adopted, well, let me back up. There's probably two different ways that Chariots is approaching this. The first is operations. And so we're committed to cleaning up our own operations. As a board, we've adopted a plan to completely phase out our fleet to zero emission vehicles by 2040. We've got 15 battery electric buses on order. And so we're well on our way there. Um, and then the other piece is, of course, interacting and partnering with the city. Uh, I was lucky enough to serve on the 41 person climate action plan task force and um, as part of that document the analysts identified that in order to meet your 2035 goals and 2050 goals public transit would ridership would need a quadruple and we're absolutely on board for that right. we're happy to continue this partnership and ensure that we can help you meet those 2035 goals excellent thank you okay where do we go from here then julie are you up next or am i no, I think um, Steve Dickey with Transit oh, is going to sorry. give a overview on the South Salem Transit Center, and then then I'll come in with some more information. Great, thank you. Hi, Steve. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Mayor Bennett. Uh, Mayor Bennett, uh, members of the City Council and President Davidson, members of uh, the Salem Area Mass Transit District Board. I'm Steve Dickey. For those of you who don't know me, and I am the Director of Technology and Program Management for uh, for Chariots. I'm going to share my screen here because I'm going to be speaking to you about the South Salem Transit Center and Mobility Hub. And can somebody give me a nod that you can see that all right? Yeah, we're good. All right. So uh, tonight, 
um, we're bringing a brief overview of where we are right now in this very important project for our district. Uh, that is the South Salem Transit Center Mobility Hub. Um, I'll start off with just why it's called that instead of just a transit center. Uh, one of the important elements of really meeting uh, transportation needs in communities, and this is becoming more and more of a focus of transit agencies across the country, is the need to be able to interconnect with other modes besides just big bus transit. And that could be small circulating buses uh, that operate in neighborhoods. It could be uh, opportunity for drop and pick up locations for transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft. It could be uh, spaces for bike share, car share, um, scooters, um, and of course, uh, easy access for bicycling and walking. And uh, if the, the location uh, affords the opportunity, an opportunity for park and ride as well. Uh, so it is really becomes more of a, a facility that, that encompasses a variety of different modal choices for people to be able to complete their trip. Uh, as we know, not all trips can be taken all the way from uh, preferred location and destination on a big bus. So this gives the opportunity to be able to facilitate an easy and convenient transfer between those modes. So a project update. Um, we have completed a multi-level screening, uh, uh, site selection screening process. It's on the map that you see here, you see an oval uh, on your screen. I know sometimes the details of these are not the easiest to be able to, to locate. So let me just give a verbal description. It's an oval that uh, aligns along South Commercial that goes just slightly north of Kubler Boulevard and goes as far south as Madras Street uh, landmarks down to about between Trader Joe's and the Courthouse Fitness Center. Would be a good, a good landmark to be able to identify the zone that we were looking at. Initially, the, the study looked at a much broader area just to take into consideration anything, any opportunities that we might have missed but really the need to stay uh, connected to our core network, which uh, Julie mentioned. Um, and for those not familiar with that, the core network is the network that is the primary focus area of the transit service and has the first priority for improvements and the last priority for uh, any service reduction or elimination. So it is really where we start increasing the frequency, making our investments. And in conjunction with that, some of the, the recent changes to development code and uh, the our Salem project have really worked in, in concert with that by focusing uh, benefits upon, for development that, that build along the, the core network. And the reason we formed that was so that there would be some permanence to transit uh, routes so that both for uh, long range planning and also for developers, there could be an assurance that 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 service will be there in the future. So we went through this multi-level screening process and we landed on a preferred site. Um, and we are now in uh, the process of selecting a contractor to com uh, complete the environmental assessment or environmental evaluation. Uh, we're hoping it will be a much lower level than an environmental assessment. And uh, we're hoping to, uh, for, uh, the plan is to bring that to our board of directors next month in October. <coughs> Uh, for contract award. Uh, selection criteria that we um, uh, utilized involved uh, uh, evaluation of the appropriate land use, uh, opportunities for transit-oriented development, transit operations, of course, the travel time, an important element with our, our services is how far out it is and how does it incorporate with the rest of the services. Of course, access to jobs, non-motorized access, park and ride expansion potential, uh, and then some other things that we always take into consideration, what is the impact of the noise, hazardous materials, impacts to adjacent properties, development costs, and ease of acquisition, and of course, uh, the price of property as well. So if you're not familiar with what a transit center uh, looks like, um, here's a couple of photos of our uh, Kaiser Transit Center that we, we constructed now almost 10 years ago. Uh, it serves uh, the north end of our, our uh, transit district and it allows us to do exactly what I talked about as far as bringing buses together and opportunity for park and ride bicycles and pedestrians. It has eight um, bus bays and 
uh, one of the important elements that we included in this design, and we will also do so with the South Island location, is incorporation of a number of environmental, uh, environmentally friendly features. As you can see, the building has a green roof, and there's a significant amount of solar on, on the site, solar power generation, and uh, it even has ground source heat pump uh, system for the heating and cooling of the building. And of course, we uh, do all of our on-site on rainwater uh, treatment before it leaves the site as well. This is a uh, design of a, what would be a prototypical design. Uh, we worked with our uh, team as we were going through the site selection process to come up with a conceptual design that would illustrate if we were to throw in everything we talked about that we would maybe like to include. So this includes everything I spoke to earlier, and it also includes some plazas, some flexible spaces, uh, plazas that possibly could be used for uh, food carts, um, public restrooms, uh, a whole list of items. Some of these things may make it through to be completion, completed, but there may be some of the things that uh, just simply because of the cost of the current escalation of cost in construction uh, may be constructed at a later date or may simply not be included in the site. That is something that's going to happen over the next several months as we go through the design process is that a decision making, uh, uh, going through the choices of what is necessary, what could be constructed later, and what uh, could we live without if we absolutely have to. So this is the area where we ended up um, centering our focus. And when uh, the contract or consultant team brought the, the final uh, site selection plan, they came down to three finalist sites, uh, which included this area up here, which is around the area that's known for Beehive Station with the food trucks. Uh, this area over here uh, that is uh, behind the Taco Bell and the subway. And then this parcel right here, which is a vacant parcel. Uh, by the time that we actually brought it to the board for the adoption of the plan, uh, this site, the most one for this to the north, already had new construction uh, taking place on it. Uh, the board did look favorably upon this site, both for the uh, one fact that it is a vacant parcel, and it is also a parcel that is large enough to give us some flexibility for uh, the possibility of some co-development. And uh, since, since that time, I was also um, alerted through a development notification that uh, this property over here behind uh, the Taco Well also has some plans uh, being considered for development at, at this time. So this really is our site that we are focusing on. And so as we look at this, um, our design team then, when they were looking at that site, uh, put together this uh, diagram sketch of how a, a multimodal center would work on that site. Uh, this would allow us to have eight bays total plus two lower layover bays that could be also equipped with charging uh, infrastructure for our battery electric buses. It separates the bus traffic from the car traffic, which would remain over here. It allows for our paratransit services to have an, an opportunity to have a bus come in at this location. Uh, and since they are trained to be able to intermingle with the buses, they would be able to cycle through and, and exit the property at this location. This, uh, this is just one concept. Uh, the reason that this corner is left vacant is in our early conversations with the uh, property owner, they had indicated that they would like to retain a portion of that parcel for uh, development, possibly of a, a medical office or something of that nature. So our next steps in this process is, uh, of course, we have our site selected. Uh, we will continue to work on the project uh, towards completion. Uh, we are continuing to put together uh, further public outreach. We did public outreach during the site selection process. The next will be involving uh, the um, public as we go through the design phase. But first, before we even get too far into that, we have to uh, perform uh, an environmental uh, evaluation of the site in, in accordance to what is required by Federal Transit Administration. Um, once that has been completed and they sign off, then we will be able to move forward with acquisition of the property. Uh, we will be doing uh, some of the design work um, as we move forward uh, 
concurrently with that so that we can make sure to keep this project moving as quickly as possible. And then, of course, once the team is completed with the environmental work and the uh, design, then uh, we will be putting out a bid for construction. And once that is done, we'll be ready to open for business. Uh, we will be bringing uh, together as, as part of the design uh, 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 committee, we will be looking for a representative from the city of Salem to be part of that, that group because it's very important that as we move forward on this project that we do so uh, in a collaborative effort. And with that, I would open up to uh, welcome any questions. A, a couple of questions, Steve. Uh, it's a great looking project, a really interesting location. Does it, uh, are you, my recollection of the Kaiser uh, project was a substantial federal and state involvement in that. Is, is that is that going to be the case here as well in terms of its development? Uh, yes, there is a significant amount of uh, federal grant money in this at this point, as well okay. as some of, and some state grant money as, as well. So yes, right. and we will continue to pursue uh, additional grant funds uh, as we look towards uh, construction. Uh, I'm sure you're you're very aware with any of the projects the city has been engaged with right now that construction costs are getting quite exorbitant so we are we are looking uh, high and low for uh, grant funds to make sure that we are great. well funded as we move forward great and the uh the other question is does this indicate um kind of a change and i'm not sure i'm going to use the terms correctly but from the pulse system you're using using the transit center downtown you sort of come in wherever you're coming from and then move to a bus that takes you back out. Is that, are you changing that with this kind of development? Yes, thank you, Mayor Ben. And thank you for bringing that up because that's a very important uh, point in regard to the construction of a facility like this. Um, you, you, you hit it right on the head. One of the things that is the downside to the type of um, design that we have, which is we call it a hub and spoke is as communities grow, the further out the spoke get from that center, the further apart they get. And then it becomes more and more difficult for people who don't necessarily want to go all the way downtown. They want to go from, in, in a figurative sense, one spoke to another out near the end of that spoke. So this, uh, but in order for us to be able to have relief points for operators for the uh, routes to function correctly and maybe have routes that don't even go downtown, you really need to have centers like this that then begin to anchor those crossing points and those neighborhood areas. So, for instance, one of the one of the routes that's in our um, in our plan, and hopefully we'll see soon, is uh, what we're calling the Kubler Connector. We know that there's a significant amount of uh, employment opportunities on the south end of the Lancaster corridor that goes on out into the Mill Creek Corporate Center. We also know that there is that Mill Creek Corporate Center out there that is in and of itself has a tremendous amount of employment opportunities and, and will continue to do so as it continues to build out. Having viable transit options for people to get to and from their jobs out there is going to be vital. And currently, if you want to get out there, you have to take one of the buses from South Salem. So let's say you're near this location where, where you propose, that would be taking Route 21 all the way downtown, transferring to route uh, any number of our routes that go out to Lancaster Drive. So that could be, uh, four, five, two, any of those. But um, if let's say you got on the five, then you have to transfer to Route 11 and then ride Route 11 down to, uh, let's say you're working at Amazon, then you have to ride Route 11 down there. The time it takes to do that is nearly an hour and a half. When you can drive that on a good day in 10 minutes, uh, even in heavy traffic, you're under, you know, under 30 minutes. And so that really is not, efficient transit if we want people to feel that that is a viable option for them to be able to use that instead of driving their car. So that's what a facility like this enables us to be able to support and, and build from. Great, great. Um, Councilor Leung. Thank you. Um, I had a question about um, what your timeline is for community outreach. And um, specifically, when would you be presenting to, for example, the neighborhood association? Um, so it would be South Gateway, 
as well as like what are your plans for how you will do this um, community outreach slash um, information gathering? Uh, thank you for that question, Councilor Leong. Um, we've already had some contact with the chair of the South Gateway Neighborhood Association, and uh, he and I spoke a few weeks back, and we're looking probably at February or March uh, meeting to come and pre uh, present as uh, as an early step in that process. Part of the reason we're waiting until then is we want to get through this environmental review process because we can't really do anything moving forward until that is done. Um, but that will be one of uh, one of many steps. We will be, uh, our focus here when we do a project like this is we'd like to do a fair amount of public involvement and outreach at the very beginning, which is, I like to, to characterize it as, tell us what you'd like to have here. And so that's when we come out and we say, this is kind of the general concept, kind of what like what you saw tonight. But then it is to listen to the public and say, okay, well, what's important to you? What are the things that you'd like to see? Uh, there may be things that we haven't even thought about that maybe we would like to take into consideration. Then we take that back to the drawing board. We work with our team to start putting together concepts and ideas. And of course, as we're going through this, we keep an updated uh, project a web page as well so people can get more up to date. As we get to some key milestones, we then bring it back and say, okay, this is what we heard. And uh, tell me now if this is, uh, if we're on track. And then one last time at the, at the end of the project saying, okay, kind of a last call for any, anything uh, that we would like to make adjustments to. But we really feel it's important to get out early first and listen and understand the needs of the community as we as we move forward. Um, that's that's an important element. Much better than putting something together based on only data that we have gathered from a from a what I say from a distance, and then say here you go, <laughs> tell us what you think. Because almost always there's going to be changes, and then that's uh, just causing the project to go backwards. Uh, Councillor Hoy, I'm going to step away for a minute if you'll take over. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, President Davidson. Thank you, Councillor Hoy. Um, I just wanted to say that at the board, at the Chariots Board, uh, we have talked about the possibility of potentially co-locating housing and with recognizing that you all have an infrastructure bond um, coming up this fall. If that passes, which I hope it does, I think I can say that, um, it, uh, you all have plans for a South Salem library with affordable housing location. And so the property that we're looking at, as Steve mentioned, is a five acre plot. We really only need about three. Now, of course, there's all kinds of hoops and hurdles that we have to jump through. Principal among them, like Steve mentioned, is the environmental review process. But then even then, um, as Steve mentioned, the existing owner is keen to keep a portion of that property for a medical facility. So a lot could go wrong, but if um, there is an opportunity, it would be wonderful to partner with you all to co-locate the South Salem Transit Center Mobility Hub along with affordable housing and library. So I wanted to just float that for you all. Um, thanks. Thank you, President uh, Davidson. I, when we started talking about when the bond started to take shape, one of the first calls I made was to you to talk about this possibility, because I think that's just really exciting. I really look forward to working with you on that. Councillor Nordyke. Uh, thank you so much. So um, I wanted to ask a follow up on the outreach. And before I get to that, I also want to make some comments about what President Davidson just said. The South Salem community needs to feel like a community. Uh, we don't have a community center, a convention center. We don't really have a great place to gather. Beehive Station has kind of become our de facto town hall. It's one of the few places where people can hang out and not have to spend a lot of money for the privilege of being present. So I see this transit center as accomplishing a lot of shared goals between chariots and the city and building community is one of them. So I encourage you and the entire design team to think about that. This is one of the few places where people can actually run into each other, where neighbors can say hello, where uh, kids from the same apartment complex can walk to a bus stop together to go to an after-school activity or return home from an after-school activity. So 
This is more than just transit, which is why I'm so excited about it. Um, and I am 100% on board with the concept of locating our affordable housing slash uh, South Salem Library hub there because this feels like a naturally good spot for it because of just basically based on the geography, I think it makes a lot of sense that this particular location that you folks are looking at makes a lot of sense just based on what I know growing up in the area. So to outreach, um, as you know, there are a lot of apartment complexes within a block or two of your proposed location. And I, as much as I appreciate our neighborhood associations, we tend to see more property owners than renters at our neighborhood association meetings. So I 100% agree with Councilor Leon that you should make presentations to our neighborhood associations but can you tell me what outreach efforts are you engaging in to make sure that Overlook Point Apartments, Vista Point Apartments, um, you know, all the uh, Battle Creek South Apartments and so on, how will those neighbors know about this project and provide input? Uh, thank you for the question, Councilor Nordyke. Um, we take uh, as much of a multifaceted approach as we can. Um, so, uh, we, we are not strong believers in the old, the old uh, everybody gather at the, you know, junior high at 7.30 on a Tuesday night and hope that everybody shows up. Um, mm -hmm. I've gotten to know some of my coworkers very well doing that, but uh, there hasn't been a lot of opportunities to talk to a lot of the public. Um, no, but to do this, we have found uh, over, the, uh, over the past several years that really us going to where people are is, is an important aspect. So looking for ways to uh, intersect people at places like grocery stores. If grocery stores will let us set up a table outside of the door to just intercept people and get their input and feedback. Uh, we, uh, during the pandemic, we also learned uh, very effective uh, use of some of our online tools, which we feel is going to be a valuable augment to the uh, in-person pieces as well, because sometimes schedules just don't work for people to get to locations or we don't happen to intersect with people. But then also utilizing um, mailers, if we're allowed to uh, provide uh, information to neighboring properties, uh, uh, multifamily, a lot of time you're not allowed to just go in and you know put things on the doors, but if we could work with the property management to at least get the word out to them, any way possible to get the word out to uh, help people become aware of this and provide a, a, a variety of ways also for input. Uh, the online open houses, we usually leave those open for several weeks and try to publish the daylights out of those through everything that we use all of our social media channels, our website, um, we've done mailers, um, anything that we can do to get the word out. Uh, the other thing is looking for effective ways to reach out for um, uh, some of our minority communities as well, and making sure that we hear from them. I, I know our board uh, has made a very, very strong point of our DEI plan, our DEI focus, and that is something that we fully support. So that is something that we also look to, um, how do we effectively make sure that we're hearing from the full spectrum of our community, not just, uh, as you said, particularly uh, homeowners that are the ones who attend our neighborhood associations. Councillor Nishioka. Thank you, Mayor Bennett. Um, some of my questions have already been asked, but I would like to find out on the public input, um, was there more interest in finding ways to get downtown or was there more interest in finding ways to get to a work site? Uh, you meant, someone mentioned Amazon. I'm just curious as to what was the focuses of some of that input that you received from the public already regarding what they were looking for? Thank you for that question, Councillor Nishioka. It was, it was actually kind of a mix. Um, we did have, we didn't hear as much about you know the need for something like this to help people get downtown because that's that's pretty well covered. But we did hear a lot of people talk about the difficulties of. Um, students wanting to attend Chemeca to community college and how long of a trip that is because of the number of transfers that they have to take. Uh, for people who are wanting to work, uh, they may want to work on the South Commercial area, they may want to work along the South Lancaster area, but 
it's those are two very very busy corridors with a number of services and employment opportunities and if you look at it though from a transportation standpoint if you don't have a car it's a pretty big gap and it's a and it's a pretty formidable gap uh it's not overly friendly for bicycle and pedestrian even to cross that gap so it is something that we heard that but we also heard about uh, people just saying well it's you know i live in south salem and so what we end up doing right now is we bring our routes out to the south end of town if you're familiar with Route 8 and 18, if anybody's ever ridden those. And in order to give some neighborhood coverage, we take these routes that have already traveled all the way out there, then we start winding them around a little bit, at least to give some neighborhood coverage. Well, that makes those routes longer, and it also makes the ride longer. And guess what? You still don't get an efficient trip from here over to here because that route still has to eventually start heading back downtown. So this also gives that greater flexibility that we heard people saying but i don't i don't want to go all the way over there and i don't want to go downtown but i just want to go across south salem and right now we can't address that effectively because our routes need to go somewhere where the operators can uh switch out and also use things like the restroom and um so that that's uh that's where we really heard a lot of that was it was a it was a mix but it was pretty much focused on where people can't go now and a lot of that is just because of the limitations of what we can do with the hub and spoke in south salem uh good answer I, I that's what i was thinking it wasn't necessarily to get downtown it's to get where they need to get in a quick or as quickly as possible manner um the uh will there is there plans for additional transfer sites like this in other areas and it's going to be a step-by-step -step process or is it going to just be this one the one in kaiser and downtown no we actually are uh, on our long longer range capital improvement plan are looking at something along the east salem side because there's a, a, a significant amount of growth especially out northeast and southeast um if you're familiar with the the neighborhoods out off of mcclay and the areas out off of kale that you're seeing uh, very significant growth in those areas and again those are areas you know we've got a we've got a frequent route up and down Lancaster but the the routes that go across Lancaster are doing the same thing that we're seeing in South Salem they're having to go out loop a little bit and then come back downtown so they can get there so we we have sort of a quasi transit center at Chemeketa Community College right now okay but it is really it, and it is actually our second busiest location to our downtown transit center, even busier than our Kaiser Transit Center. Um, but we have uh, the last I uh, last information I had. We have 17 buses an hour that go through there. Oh wow! And both regional and local buses, and just the place where they all have to come together, plus the cars and people walking, it's not good. I mean, we were extremely careful and such, but we really need to work with things so we have uh, had some very very preliminary conversations with Chemeketa and maybe looking at opportunities there to really develop something that is actually more functional as a transit center um, and then uh, we are also there's a concept called um, super stops which is uh, closest thing to a super stop is a stop that's in front of the Walmart on South Commercial basically stretched a little bit longer so you could get two or three buses in but a true super stop would have better waiting areas for passengers, but it doesn't take as big of a footprint. And uh, we may be looking at the addition of some of those throughout our system as well. Um, we're thinking somewhere down there in that area of uh, the South Lancaster near the, the uh, Winco, uh, there would be a great opportunity there. Then our circulating buses could go in and out of those neighborhoods and provide better service there. Okay. One and, and West, yeah. So in West Salem, we also have the West Salem Center, but it's it probably could use some upgrades. Uh, it's been there a long time. I th I think that sounds like the super stop sounds like a great idea, so that there's a little bit less investment, but still supports a number of people. The last question I have at these locations or at, at the south location and future planned, will there be additional parking for people that are meeting? to co-share ride so um, the idea that they may not be riding on the buses or 
the other transport that are available, but they might meet there so that they can have four or five people to go to wherever they need to go. Is that something that may be available in addition to just those riding the buses? Uh, that is definitely in the in that longer list of, of elements uh, that we are looking at of you know and how big will it be and what can we do and so that was that was something too when we heard this other uh, the property owner was interested in keeping portion of that well there would have to have parking for that so we looked at that as an yes. opportunity also well why don't we co-develop the parking then so we have a functional uh, area where people can come and go so our Kaiser Transit Center does have that uh, capacity and it is not limited to just people who are parking there to ride the bus. In fact, uh, pre-COVID, uh, when, when most people were still going into the office, uh, it was actually full every day. Uh, we had a number of people that were just parking rides. A lot of that was because of its proximity to I-5. So it was very convenient for people carpooling uh, out of, in and out of the area. Yes, I have used that one for park and ride, meeting friends and then heading into Portland together. So that's why I asked that question um, because it was really helpful and um, such a nice place to leave your car. You know, you just felt like it would be fine. Oh so, yeah. So thank you. That's, that's I'll end my questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Counselor. Um, Sadie Carney. Thank you, Mayor Bennett. Um, hi everybody. Uh, I just wanted to bring up something here that I brought up in our board me meeting when we were looking at the site selection. Um, and that is transit really succeeds when there is good pedestrian connectivity within the surrounding infrastructure. And that's a challenge for the, the part of town that we are seeking to serve. But I do think we have an opportunity as we move forward with updating the city of Salem's transportation system plan um, to really prioritize pedestrian connectivity, look at different ways we can heal the grid and activate those transportation networks, particularly for transit and pedestrian and, and bicycling. Um, it really you know, can increase, I think the neighborhood cohesion. I live in ward one where I am thankful to have a great city councilor, but I am also thankful to have a really connected grid. Um, you know, we have alleyways that feel safe with a stroller on a bicycle um, where I can get away from, you know, car cars moving through the neighborhood. Um, we also have streets that are narrow. It forces the cars to slow down. Um, these are just things to think about as we think about what gets people out and walking, what makes people feel safe when they're using public transportation or a sidewalk, um, and some of the challenges we might have with seeing a South Salem Transit Center succeed in the face of the infrastructure that's in place there today. So, you know, as we're moving forward as a group of leaders in our community, I really encourage us to think about ways that we could leverage the update to our transportation system plan to really help um, our neighborhoods and our transit district and our city succeed all together. Great, thanks. Thanks, Sadie. Uh, Councilor Phillips. Thank you, Mayor Bennett. Um, and thank you, Steve, uh, for your, your excellent summary um, and kind of description of where things are at and where they're hopefully going very soon. Um, I do have a question uh, based on some of the um, information you provided tonight. Uh, and I mean, as the representative of Ward 3, which includes uh, Southeast Salem and east of I-5 uh, at the south end, um, I want to thank you for mentioning, you know, the problem, the deficiency that, you know, residents in this area of town are facing if they work out at Amazon and that, that region that's rapidly growing um, in terms of it taking, you know, an hour to an hour and a half to get there by bus. Uh, what I want to understand is expectations. Um, it sounds like it will improve when we get... Um, you know, when we finally bring to fruition the South Salem uh, Transit Center, but does it require uh, the second transit center as well in Southeast Salem to really be, um, you know, to make a big difference or do we get a significant benefit even before we get that second uh, transit center on the east side of I-5? 
I think we'll see a significant benefit. Um, one of the reasons for that is, you know, with our frequent service on Lancaster Drive, which goes actually, it's, it's quite a long route. And uh, and just as an aside, that's also our our targeted first uh, corridor for battery electric buses to operate upon that on that route. Um, is we will see service opportunities there. And one of the things that we do have along that corridor for connectivity east and west is, uh, in, while it's far, far from a perfect grid system, we do have a number of locations across there where routes cross the 11, Route 11 up and down Lancaster, that go both into the neighborhoods east of Lancaster and into downtown. So they, they cross at State Street, at Center Street, at Market Street, uh, they travel over to Sunnyview. Uh, the next one is at Silverton Road, and then up at, uh, uh, I believe, Hayesville is the next uh, crossing point. And those uh, give opportunities for people to be able to make that uh, trip. It's just when you get out closer to Cordon, and especially up into the very northeast corner and the, the new development that's out off of McClay, uh, that it has, we haven't been able to spread it out that far and still maintain the frequencies to get downtown. Um, although we have some things in, in the plans, uh, hopefully that we uh, can uh, get the funding that we need soon to be able to put in place to expand some of that coverage into those areas. But I think by putting this in place, it creates those essential connections. And then uh, we also have a, a bus stop improvement program. So we are improving the stops along those corridors and focusing especially on those transfer points adding shelters and making it much more convenient for people. And then that's also where we will be looking for opportunities for those super stops to be developed. Um, so I think it is a big step forward to get this in place because it makes that connectivity possible. Right now, it just doesn't, it's not even something that we can uh, begin to, to do. Thank you for that. Uh, it answers my question. And I too really think that the super stops could make a big difference without much, um, without, without as much of a resource cost. So that's a, that's a great idea. Um, thank you for, for that information. Thank you. Well, thank you, Councillor Phelps. Uh, Councillor Stapleton. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, yeah, I wanted to piggyback onto what uh, Sadie was talking about. Um, and just so much of the learning that I've done about, um, you know, really increasing your ridership uh, with, uh, public transportation is about it's not only that the bus runs on time that the bus is clean and that uh you know there's timely service and uh it's about where you end up at right and if you get off the bus and can then safely walk and feel comfortable walking or biking from that location to wherever it is that you're going out to eat to shop to work etc um, those are almost as vital as the system itself and so I too really uh, want to focus on that a lot. I, I loved uh, hearing about the increase in shelters. I know um, when I drive out Portland Road, uh, you just see you know a little stake in the ground with a sign, right? And there might be a seat, one seat attached to this, uh, but no shelter from the sun uh, or rain or weather. Um, and so if we can increase the, the livability of these locations to be somewhere that people want to be, um, then you're going to increase um, you know, the, the standing of how people view public transportation. I know that's really important. I would love to see these become areas of public, um, that public art is displayed or that, um, you know, we have all those pull outs that uh, are around town already. I would love to see street art in those, just anything to really elevate public transportation in the mind of the public, I think would be really fantastic. Um, and I will say um, that Councillor Leung had to step away, uh, but she asked me to ask a question on her behalf. Um, she said that she has some concerns about the location um, that you've chosen because of the high traffic in the area and uh, because of the renters close by with the exhaust coming from uh, this location. So I was wondering if you could address those two concerns um, and she also asked, uh, why not uh, use the Kubler station? Um, there's a hub there anyway, and, and about adding to that. And I, I'm sorry that I am not familiar with the area, so I don't know exactly what she is referring to, but I'm hoping that you can answer those for her so that she can come back at a later time and, and listen to the answer. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Stapleton. Um, yeah, there's, 
there's a lot of complexity that went into the site selection, and, and one of those details is is how well it ties to your your core route. Uh, we did look, and when we were looking at the expanded area, when you when you say Kubler Station, I'm assuming that's the facility over there that has the the Costco and the uh, Salem Clinic and and um, um, PT Northwest, which I think I have a punch card for them, but um, that's a whole different thing. Um, that is one of those locations that we look at pretty heavily, but the time, the additional time it takes to go to and from the commercial corridor for that core route, it added too much time to be able to really effectively utilize that and not really disrupt the ability to, to stay true to that mission of that piece of it. And that piece of it is really a part of it that we are focused on. Um, making sure that uh, when we establish the core route that it will be reliable and it's going to be there. Um, the other piece of that, as far as the exhaust, that is one of the things the environmental value uh, review will take into consideration. Um, now, our fleet right now, we have some diesel buses. The, those diesel buses do use uh, biodiesel and do have, um, the, I forget the technology in our, our uh, but it is basically a it's a scrub system to minimize the, the emission. So they, even though they are diesel buses, they're extremely low emission. And those are the buses that are actually being phased out as we bring in battery electric buses. The rest of our fleet is uh, compressed natural gas. And those actually, um, it's a water vapor and um, uh, water vapor and carbon dioxide is basically what the exhaust is, but it's, there's no, uh, particulates or anything of that nature that come from those. And those are always improving as well in the, the technology. The other thing that they continue to do is improve how quiet they are. Um, in fact, the battery electric buses in some of the communities that uh, we have, have actually added sound for a safety component because they are so quiet uh, for a pedestrian's perspective, they need to hear, it's, it's like our new, um, I've got a, RAV4 and we call it the scary space sound when it's in reverse to back up. So it's something to make people are aware that it's there. So huge improvements over what the buses used to be and uh, will, will continue to be so, but one of the elements in the design will be how do we prevent at, uh, both air and noise pollution and interference with neighboring properties. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Duncan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we were talking a lot about the infrastructure of the area and the, you know, how everything's integrated together in order to make this a successful project. And this is this is my district. And I can say that one of my concerns that I definitely will be asking the city council for cooperation on is the sidewalk network in the facility, like in the area around this site is incomplete. Um, and so if you are trying to walk that area, you will run into multiple areas where the sidewalk disappears altogether. Um, additionally, areas where there are sizable gaps in pieces of the sidewalk that make it unwalkable or dangerous to walk. And I know that that is a piece that you guys are looking for with your infrastructure bond and everything, but it is something that as we're all working together to make this project feasible, we should all keep it attention to because we have certain requirements necessary in order to even put a shelter in place that the sidewalk has to be able to accommodate. Um, and those are pieces that I'm sure staff will work together to kind of converse about, but something for you um, to be aware of that we really do need buy-in for some of these pieces to do what we need to do um, successfully and sidewalks and the, that type of connectivity is a big one. Um, same thing with the biking community. If you have the opportunity to take the bus over to Beehive Station and then maybe just try to walk like two stores over where it wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. even, you wouldn't want to take the bus, you know, it's close enough, you'll see very quickly what I'm talking about. And if you have the time, I encourage you to do that. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Hoy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks, Steve, for the information. I want to go back to what you were talking about a minute ago about, uh, I can't think of the term you used, but basically stop improvement. Um, where you're improving the current stops. Um, there's my bus stop. I've been talking about it for five years, the, the five years I've been on city council, and it continues to not be great. And it's, um, if you're up on the curb, you're, you're standing in wood chips and there's no curb cut, there's no anything, or, and if you, so if you have mobility issues, you're walking in the street. 
Um, and it's one, you know, I live out in East Salem. So it's one of those areas where it's right on the city county, literally the bus stop is on the city county line. Um, and so, but it's one of those that just keeps getting overlooked in terms of, it's just, it's literally a sign, a, a sign pole uh, in some, in the, the bark dust. Um, I'm wondering how you're going about looking at those and prioritizing them and when we might expect something out here in East Salem. Um, thank you for that, uh, Councillor Hoy. We are actually um, systematically working through. It takes um, it takes a significant amount of time each grouping. Um, we're we're working through to improve. I think it's three hundred and I think it's a total of around three hundred and seventy stops in our system, and we've gotten about halfway through that process. So, um, if you uh, would if you don't mind sending in the location to uh, uh, you can just send it to steve.dickey at chariots.org and I will um, cross check against our list and see if we can get that um, uh, if that's already in where it's headed about what the plan is for it uh, for general description can I just mention sound, that it, pardon can I just mention that it's at the corner of Walker and future Walker and future okay yeah I'll have to I'll have to take a look at that. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Steve, appreciate the information. You know, Sarah and I were just talking the other day and she suggested, she thought it'd be really important that us as groups, as the council and your board get together more often. You know, just paint it, listen to this discussion, just thinking of all the places where our work intersects, you know, um, and we got to work together. And I suggest maybe we jump on the bus. I was just had to had to really think about it here. But in my life, I've never been on a city bus, never once. You know, so maybe we can all get together and walk some of those paths, Sarah, and that way we can see it for ourselves. So, field trip. Great, yeah, great suggestion. Okay, where are we then? Who's who's next? Julie. Yes, that would be back to me. <laughs> Okay, so let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Yep. Great. So I'm going to give some highlights of some recent and upcoming projects at the city and the city has recently completed two planning efforts that have a direct relationship to both land use and transportation planning, the R Salem project and the climate action plan. The R Salem project was a multi-year project to update our comprehensive plan and associated maps and zoning code. The city council adopted the project this summer after more than three and a half years of community engagement. This work will guide how Salem grows and develops for decades to come. And it aims to help Salem meet many of our challenges ahead, including addressing our housing crisis and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. The work was done in collaboration with chariots and many new policies and map changes focus on coordinating land use with transit service. The climate action plan um, for Salem was initiated in 2020 following city council's adoption of two goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Salem. First, by 2035, Salem aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. And then by 2050, Salem aims to be carbon neutral. The Climate Action Plan was developed with the assistance of a 41-member Climate Action Task Force, including President Davidson representing the Transit District. The plan was completed in late 2021 and accepted by City Council earlier this year. It includes 183 different strategies to reduce emissions and increase Salem's resilience to the impacts of climate change. Almost one quarter of the strategies are directly tied to transportation and land use. The city has committed to embarking on an update to the Salem Transportation System Plan 
as one of the highest priorities associated with implementation of the R Salem Comprehensive Plan update and several of the Climate Action Plan strategies. The Salem Transportation System Plan is the city's 20 year master plan for all things transportation. I'm going to try to avoid using acronyms, but I may slip up and use TSP, which stands for Transportation System Plan. This plan was originally developed in the mid 1990s and adopted in 1998. It covers all modes of transportation, including transit. The plan has been amended on a regular basis, including in 2012 to incorporate the recommendations from the Bike and Walk Salem plan. The most recent amendments were in 2020. Through the R Salem project, the goals for transportation in the comprehensive policies plan were updated including goals for all modes of transportation. While most of these issues were previously addressed in the Salem TSP, the updated goals present the opportunity to revisit the plan to ensure that the policies, programs, projects, and priorities align with the newly adopted goals, as well as to advance strategies included in the Climate Action Plan. Separately from the city actions, the state has been developing new rules relating to transportation and land use through the climate friendly and equitable communities rulemaking. These new rules were adopted in July. The objectives of the new state rules align closely with many of the goals and objectives identified through the R Salem project. They're also consistent with the climate action plan. These new rules will impact how we proceed with updating the Salem Transportation System Plan so that we comply with the new requirements. There are two categories of rulemaking. Regional planning to achieve pollution reduction targets and land use and transportation rules that support the regional plans and promote equity. Both apply to Salem's work program moving forward. The regional planning requirements will guide how the Salem-Kaiser area intends to meet Oregon's climate pollution reduction targets, which are established in state rule. For the Salem-Kaiser area, the rules require by 2050, a minimum 30% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from light vehicles. I want to highlight that this is different from the city's goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. That goal applies to all sectors, not just transportation. The first phase of the transportation system plan update will be to establish a regional policy framework to guide how our region will meet the state established reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. This effort will be closely coordinated with transit as a strong transit system is a key tool in reducing transportation related greenhouse gas emissions. The regional framework will set performance measures and targets that Salem will need to achieve through the transportation system plan. The second phase of the transportation system plan update will include identifying changes needed to the transportation system in order to achieve these targets and meet the additional requirements in state rules. In addition to transportation systems for cars, bikes, and people walking, the city is also required to have a plan for transit. Creating this plan will lean heavily on chariots, building on the long range transit plan. Staff is currently developing the work program and timeline to most efficiently respond to policy direction from our Salem the Climate Action Plan, and the new state rules. At the same time, we have initiated work on updating the Neighborhood Traffic Management Plan, and we are currently collecting transportation asset data. Staff will be providing additional information on the land use components of the new state rules to City Council in a report at the next Council meeting. A discussion of parking policy requirements established by the state climate friendly and equitable communities rules 
will be initiated with the Council Climate Action Plan Committee in November. Phase one of the Salem Transportation System Plan update will, is expected to launch in 2023. This concludes my presentation. I will just stop sharing. Thank you. And be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Julie? Julie, as you listen to what was being said uh, by the uh, transit uh, folks, did did any of that, does all that fit well with what we're up to? I mean, are we getting our, uh, is the coordination in place and working at this point? Yes, I would say very much so, um, more so than it has been in the past. So I appreciate right. all the efforts. Very good. Uh, Councillor Stapleton. Thank you so much. Um, I just I have a, a general question, I guess, for you, Julie. Um, in the beginning, you had uh, mentioned about a new developments that we reserve some space for bus stops um, so that there isn't any parking there or kind of any conflicts uh, so that the bus can get right up close to um, some of those uh, the shelters and able people with mobility issues or whatnot don't have any conflicts trying to get on the bus. What are we doing about the existing stops that we have in cities? Um, or across the city where there there are conflicts and there is parking that's blocking and, and there are challenges for folks with mobility issues to even get on the bus. Could you address that? Yes, um, that is um, something that we're working on with chariots in association with their transit stop improvement project. So where they, they, they come in and they're looking at making improvements to a stop They've identified ones that require parking removement, removal, sorry. And that's something that we then work, we ask them to do some public outreach and work through the Citizen Advisory Traffic Commission to get input on. Um, it is occasionally controversial. And so it's something that I think it's important for city council to understand the importance of that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I know a lot of people really like their parking on the street, don't they? Um, and that can be hard. I had one more question, if it's all right, Mayor. Yeah. Um, and I, I was asking about, uh, you know, in the climate action plan, there is that emphasis on improving the sidewalk infrastructure and connectivity within a quarter mile of the core network. Um, and when I ask this question, sometimes I get the response that it's not, uh, it's not an equitable uh, approach. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that, um, but my, my question is, is that does the core network reach into every single ward across the city? Do you know that? I know that's kind um, of a connection of both people here. You know, you have wards and somebody else has the network, but I'm just wondering if, because if that is the case, right, um, then if every ward is getting a, their fair share of, of sidewalk improvement and infill, then we can kind of lay that to rest and really focus on uh, updating that so that we can increase ridership and all of the things that we've talked about here tonight. Um, and if you can't answer that question, then I, I understand, but that is a question that I do have. Okay. Yeah, I did not bring with me a map of the, chair, the core network in my mind. It goes into most wards. Um, I'm not sure how much it goes into Ward 8 um, because there is some core network in West Salem, but it's mostly in the lower areas. Um, so yeah, I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, uh, Sadie Carney. Thank you, Mayor Bennett. Um, so for folks that may not know this, I work for the Department of Land Conservation and Development. That was the, the state agency acronym you saw at the beginning of that piece about the climate friendly and equitable communities rulemaking. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that my question doesn't get too into the weeds and I apologize if it does. Um, and I think there's maybe a couple pieces to it. So one thing that's included in the, the CFEC because we like to use acronyms at the state, the climate friendly and equitable communities rules um, is the coordination of planning for housing and planning for transportation. Kind of like the conversation we were having earlier about South Salem Transit Center. Wouldn't it be great if we could do the two things together? 
Um, and one of the ways that it tries to do that or that it's trying to do that moving forward is through the designation of something called a climate friendly area. And um, Salem is gonna have to have some climate friendly areas. If we think about what might help us, you know, meet uh, transportation needs and an activated bicycle network along a high capacity transit corridor where there's a lot of housing, we might already have a couple of those places in mind in Salem, right? It might just be as easy as drawing a line on a map. Um, but uh, included within the Salem urban growth boundary is a heavily urbanized portion of Marion County. And I recognize that they are not here this evening. And I do think they're kind of missing from this part of the conversation um, because they also, they have enough urbanized density within the urban growth boundary that they also have to designate a climate friendly area. And um, I, I, I am not familiar with every stretch of road um, you know, in those neighborhoods, um, but there is some missing infrastructure um, that's going to make it hard, you know, it's going to make it costly to get to a place where we have sidewalks and bike lanes um, that are adequate to support active neighborhoods that are walkable um, and, 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 you know, and are accessible to transit and by transit. Um, and so I do, I think that as we're moving forward with these conversations, we should also consider them a partner in, in helping us reach some of our, of our climate goals, of our transportation goals, et cetera. And I just was wondering if city staff could speak to what that coordination looks like at this time and how we might um, kind of all get together on the same page moving forward. Thank you for that question. Um, so uh, one of the things that Director Carney mentioned was what the state is referring to as climate friendly areas. Um, we internally are referring to those really as walkable mixed use areas. And I alluded to um, that we are going to be bringing a staff report to city council at the very next meeting that goes into some more detail on this. Um, we. The state is funding a uh, study to help us move forward with this. And they're not only helping us, but they're also helping Marion County. And so we are coordinating on that, um, on that work. Uh, we anticipate, you know, I referred to the first phase being a folk transportation system plan phase one. There are land use components to it. However, for Salem, we really are looking to build on the our Salem land use changes that were made because while that was in process, we knew about these rules being developed. We didn't know the details, um, but we were already trying to build that in. And so I don't think we are gonna have to make a, you know, a ton of changes from what we've done with our Salem in order to comply with the rules. Um, also, that planning did go out to the urban growth boundary, so it, at least the Salem portion, so it did include those Marion County areas. I'm hoping I actually answered your question. Very yeah, close. Yeah, I think you did. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm, I'm just, I'm really happy to hear that answer. So appreciate it. Should we be including uh, the county in these meetings if we do this, if we do these work sessions in the future, Julie? Do you think? I mean, would. Is there a comparable? There, there may at some point be um, one of the first things that we are working on as part of um, developing our work program is how best to work together to develop this regional framework that we're required to do. And so at some point there may be a um, need for a joint work session or maybe we have some sort of subcommittee working group that focuses okay. on it. Thank you. Um, District Member Nguyen. Uh, you're muted. Thank you, sir. Thank there you, you uh, Mr. Bennett, Mayor Bennett. Um, I proudly represent uh, Subdistrict 1, which covers um, Councilor Varney's Ward 8. And I just, my hand is not so much a question as it is a comment that I, I noticed that their staff manager Eunice Kim on this call and I having personally worked in community outreach and organizing work 
we wouldn't be able to get the amazing qualitative and quantitative data without the works like Eunice and others being in community as well, working with community to build trust. Um, I have seen her literally before I was even in my seat uh, serving uh, the Chariots Board for years. And you're talking back to school events, West Salem Neighborhood Association, West Salem Business Association meetings. And so I just um, I want to send kudos to the staff like Eunice out there who are on this call um, who did the amazing outreach work because it wasn't that you casted a mile wide and inch thick. You really were deep, um, deeply engaged. And so uh, I applaud their, their efforts as well as um, the city council for approving it this last July. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Eunice is a spectacular person in that area. Don't anyone try recruiting her. Just leave her alone. She's doing a great job for her community. So, Sadie, did you want to? I was just applauding uh, her amazing work. Ah, and I okay. think that I, I let our board members uh, know at a meeting, um, I think, last month, um, but I know I had the the privilege of presenting uh, or, or sort of sitting in the back seat while uh, my CIAC chair, my Citizen Involvement Advisory Committee chair presented an award to the city of Salem for their achievement in community engagement um, in their work associated with our Salem. And it truly was spectacular um, and, and worthy of recognition. So it's spot on. Director Wynn, we're, I we're could not very agree Very proud of her and her work. Okay, Sarah, did you want to speak? I was waffling back and forth about speaking about the sidewalks on the core network because the reality of the situation is sidewalk improvements are, are needed everywhere desperately. Um, and so I, it's hard to say if it's equitable or not because, you know, like my neighborhood, in order to get to my stop, which is 10 minutes walking distance, there is, are no sidewalks in my neighborhood. The, when they, the sidewalks do show up, I then have to cross Fairview Industrial Drive without a crosswalk oh. to then walk under a unlit overpass to get to my bus stop. So the, that, which is a large part of why I joined the transit committee. And I live in South Salem, five minutes from Cambridge, which is one of the nicer, more developed parts of South Salem. And yet this is still a challenge. So it's, it's hard to say. I would say that starting with the core network is a great place to start because so many people are, we know are walking that area and not even the core network has complete uh, sidewalks, but it, it's gonna be a problem that we're tackling for years to come. Um, and so, I mean, there's a lot of projects going on to try to quantify or really decide the best places to start, but it's it's a comprehensive problem. And I'm, I'm so glad that we're talking about it because it's close to my heart, that's all. It's a it's an, a very common discussion and has been for many years in the city, inside the city in the city council and city planning activity. Sidewalks is an ongoing issue. Um, where is Courtney? Courtney, are you there? Yes, Mayor Bennett, how can I help? Uh, Julie, is there some, I just stay there for a second. Julie, is there anywhere else we need to go now? No, I think that um, that was, you know, we just wanted you guys to have a robust okay. discussion. And I really appreciate that you did throughout the um, presentation. That was very helpful. Is there anything we, we missed? We should have, I'm sure there is. I, that's a rhetorical <laughs> question, but is there anything you'd recommend we uh, take a few minutes on while we're still together? No. Okay. Courtney, is there anything you'd like us to move on? I see. I see the counselor. Do you, let me call on him first. See if he has some suggestions. Councilor Phillips. I, I'd almost forgot this is kind of in that last section of the, if we're done with the main presentation. Um, I, I have some genuine questions on how to proceed, um, you know, and if, whether or not this is this is the place um, in terms of, you know, deficiency that exists between Ward 3 and Ward 2 uh, east of I-5. Um, there's a there's a real issue with, um, you know, kids, bicyclists and anybody trying to go from south of Highway 22 uh, to the, the grade school that's on the other side of Highway 22 to the north. Sure. Um, I mean, I think the, the big fix maybe a few decades from now is a 
the Corden overpass, you know, becoming updated to an exchange. Um, but I know it's been talked about at SCATS. I mean, I really appreciate hearing from uh, director, um, you know, uh, Sadie Carney tonight. Uh, her work on SCATS has been really um, great to see and, and alternate uh, director, Sarah Duncan. Um, they've done some good things behind the scenes on SCATS, but um, I, I would like some direction and understanding because I think I've been told that SCATS is the place to try to make a difference um, yeah. on that kind of link up, but I, I don't know what to do next to advocate for it. I mean, we've started the conversation. It's going to take time, but it's just, it's, it's not an, I, I really need to know if those are two separate things. It's really, is there the, the Cordon Road overpass just needs to be updated at some point, which is a big deal. That's probably way in the future. Or is there also a pedestrian bicycle bridge that, that could be, should be built uh, further to the west in between Cordon Road and um, I-5? And I don't have to have this answer tonight. I don't have to answer. Well, Julie tonight. may have an answer, but she probably has a suggestion as to. Yeah, I have. Them. I guess I have a couple of suggestions. Um, and, you know, you won't be surprised that there really aren't quick fixes. But in terms of next steps, there's sort of two paths. One is that uh, we are working collaboratively with Marion County on a planning study for the Cordon Road um, Kubler Corridor with a focus on uh, multimodal, you know, bike pad access. And the outcome of that planning effort is, you know, going to help inform our ultimate plans for those roads, you know, do, is what we have now planned correct? And then also our priorities. So, you know, where, where are the highest priorities for improvements along that corridor? And so I would encourage you and everybody else to engage in that process. I know that they do have a website and I believe they're supposed to be coming out with um, some draft concepts either later this month or next month. Um, so that's sort of one path. The second path is that we did last week submit a pre-application to the state of Oregon to um, for funding of a refinement plan for a pedestrian bicycle overcrossing in that area you talked about between Lancaster and Porton Road over Highway 22. The need for that crossing has been in our plan for many years. However, the you know when you look at a master plan for the whole area, a lot of the projects are you know big lines on a small map and before they can proceed to that next step of trying to actually get funding they need to have a closer look and so this is one that needs that closer look we have submitted a that pre-application to the state for funding for a refinement plan the final applications are due at the end of january um, so once we get feedback from Oregon Department of Transportation, we'll determine how to move forward with that. Um, but those are the two, two paths on that. The other thing, of course, is once we know what we want, it's looking to SCATS for when funding opportunities come up. So if we you know, identify a bicycle pedestrian bridge as a priority and it's say it's $10 million, you know, looking for both grants city funds as well as um, SCATS funding, which flows through their federal funds. Unfortunately, it is limited. And as you know, we've um, had with cost escalations, you know, they're being sort of conservative right now and trying not to pro over promise for new projects. Phillips is in the right place being on the SCATS uh, uh, board. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank sure you. Sure to keep informed you want to stay on that board. Okay. <laughs> uh, Sadie. Thank you, Mayor Bennett. We certainly appreciate having Councillor Phillips as part of that group. Um, <laughs> uh, so I have the Councillor Phillips question and a lot of our conversations um, so far tonight, right, are about uh, sort of finding space for safe passage, be it pedestrian, bicycle, school children, to the transit center, away from the transit center to get to your job. Um, and I serve on SCATS, maybe I should know this, um, but it seems to me that one of the very big challenges, and you know, a challenge when I, when I say something like heal the grid, 
um, and, and making pedestrian passageways in an otherwise disconnected part of our community. We're talking about eminent domain, right? And that's taking people's land for a public purpose. Um, and I just don't know that much about that process. I don't know, like, is there a way, could we just get the whole city to agree? Is it like parcel by parcel? Um, how much does that add to the process? How much of a barrier is it to us being successful in implementation in this regard? Um, Cause you know, we're, we're, either, we're either looking at eminent domain taking away, you know, somebody's lawn or the edge of their property, or I think it's, you know, the McGilchrist project has had quite a bit of, or we're talking about taking away a travel lane, right? So that we can put in sidewalks and bike lanes. Um, and I know the, the appetite is low for both of those. I know where mine is stronger, um, but can anyone speak to that part of the process and that step in problem solving? I will try at sort of a high level. <laughs> I mean, basically, you know, every project has to start by being identified in a plan you know, or having design standards that support it. And then when you move forward and into, um, you, you know, you get funding for design and right of way and construction, that's when you go out and you, you know, get approval to do eminent domain if you have to, but you start out by doing um, negotiation with willing sellers. And then if you have to move into eminent domain, then people in our engineering section do a lot more of this, our right-of-way section, so I'm not at all an expert. Um, I think it happens, you know, it's, it's not that uncommon of an occurrence, um, but I probably shouldn't say more because I'm gonna get myself in trouble here. Very good. That's, I mean, it, it's just kind of an interesting piece of the puzzle to me. Um, because we have what feels like a fairly pervasive problem in neighborhoods all over our community. Um, and I just was hoping to understand how much a piece of the puzzle it is to get us from here to there. Well, I see that um, Tom Kupani turned his camera on, so maybe he has some wisdom that he can share. Fantastic. Uh, well, Julie did a good job of summarizing uh, the process. Uh, the things that I would point out are that we always attempt to negotiate uh, an acquisition uh, uh, before uh, going to the eminent uh, domain process. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, folks are compensated uh, for the property that we take, and they often receive a, uh, a premium uh, as part of the, the domain process, eminent domain process. So, you know, the main impediment that uh, uh, occurs is that it's very, very expensive to acquire property by eminent domain. And, um, uh, you know, money is always a, uh, a, a considering factor. Councilor Phillips. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Bennett. Um, first, just to correct uh, inadvertent oversight, uh, uh, board member uh, Maria Inojos Pressi serves on SCATS as well. And I just in the moment, I forgot. I'm so sorry. Uh, but uh, to, to the question at hand, would it be appropriate to say that um, for kind of recent activity that we're seeing as counselors, would the Marine Drive expansion be what we should look to as kind of what we've done recently that kind of answers this question and how we would expect to proceed on uh, board member Carney's question. Tom, what do you think? Uh, I'm not entirely familiar with the, the Marine uh, Drive uh, acquisition process, so I'm not sure I can answer that. Maybe Julie can. Help me out there. Julie? Um, if you're referring to the acquisitions that we did relatively recently, Councillor Phillips? Yeah, I mean, just in that we, uh, maybe it's, a, I, I'm so off base, it's not even a good question. Um, but we, I mean, I get the sense that, uh, you know, eminent domain is is expensive, 
and we didn't do really eminent domain for Marine Drive. It was Can all about any eminent. Yeah, it's yeah. it's willing seller, willing buyer. I think more than right, needs. right. Um, I mean, there are just different circumstances, and with the Marine Drive uh, right of way acquisition that was accomplished um, pretty recently, the issue there was that we, you know, didn't we don't have funding for construction, right? And so. Um, to justify using eminent domain to acquire right of way when we don't actually have the the money to construct i'm not sure if that's even possible but it would be a hard sell um so we were doing willing seller um transactions now if the bond passes when the bond passes and includes money for you know design right of way and construction of marine drive any property that we haven't been able to acquire once again, we would reach out for willing sellers, but in that case, we'd have the, the funding for construction and we would move to eminent domain if needed to get the rest. Thank you. That helps me understand it, even if it seems clunky. I appreciate it. Okay. Any other go to the org? Yes, Councillor Barney. Thank you, Mayor Bennett. I know I've been really quiet tonight, just kind of listening um, because Ward 8 is kind of a different kind of animal. <laughs> so I really appreciate everyone uh, being here in this discussion and the really informative presentations. And I've been viewing them through a lens of a West Salem resident. Uh, folks here, you know, have seen, uh, obviously they're a lot of them are upset about the traffic congestion all over and the bridges and the fact that our Salem uh, with the rezoning process, we're going to be looking at more multifamily housing in in West Salem. And really, folks don't feel they have an alternative to get out of their cars at this point. Um, and I just wanted to just speak up and just say, you know, that's that's an issue and I don't see any easy answer in the future. But I like the plan for the South Salem Transit Center. Having a hub down there is going to be really helpful, even for West Salem residents who may work down there. Um, we definitely need a connection because uh, I know uh, I have a bus stop close to where I live, but of course I can get to work out on Fairview Industrial in half an hour, but again, it's another hour and a half plus for me to get home. Um, and so they're just options. I just wanted to mention, I'm really glad we're going to be jumping into this transportation planning and we'll see what we can do for Ward 8 as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, Courtney, uh, what will be the future of these uh, work sessions? Will you, will you and the transit district be developing future agendas and uh, meetings? We certainly can at key milestones that might be coming up in the planning processes. As you could tell, there are really quite a lot of um, efforts underway. And so next steps for each of the, those processes are kind of moving at different paces. And so it will be on us, on staff, to make sure that our um, governing boards are aware of those key next steps as decisions are coming closer. But this will be quite a process. We will be um, planning um, our Salem, the long range transit plan is probably happening at a quicker pace, but, but all of the our Salem work that follows on the transportation system plan update, the, all of the other pieces, the climate friendly and equitable communities rulemaking and, and what that means um, for all of us, the regional transportation um, networking, all of that planning, those bits will be with us for quite a quite a while. And so we should and, and could have more of these conversations as we get to key milestones. Okay, well, good. I think that'd be the kind of thing you may want to work out with the council leadership in the future. These are these are very productive if if they are occurring at the right times in the planning process. So sounds good. OK, if there's no further discussion, does anyone have anything else? Then uh, we'll be adjourned for this evening. And thank you very much, uh, Ian. Thank you very much for this. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks for hosting.
For more videos and for more information, go to capitalcommunitymedia.org and follow us on social media.